Hey, how you doing? Brian Kane, the host of the Brian Kane Mental Performance Mastery Podcast. And today, my guest is someone who's achieved success at every level of football, including the NFL, where he plays outside linebacker and special teams for the Los Angeles Rams. But before the NFL, he was a breakout star at Texas Pottsboro High School, where he was also a power lifter in addition to playing football. He went on to become a first-team all-conference player at Southern Methodist University, SMU, Pony Up, where in his senior year alone, he recorded 74 tackles and nine and a half sacks, where Justin Lawler and I met when he was playing at SMU. So welcome to the podcast today, J-Law, Justin Lawler. Thanks for being with us, man. Appreciate it, Brian. It's so good to actually be on one instead of listening to him. Well, it was funny, but before we got on the air, you talked about how you were driving across the country when the season ended from L.A. back to Texas, and we're going through listening to a lot of the podcasts. Is that right? Yeah, try to use every second and uh, had to kind of stay awake. I drove through the night, so put on a little Brian Kane, get some juice going in the car. Let's go, baby. Well, if you're juiceful, what are you, J-Law? You're useful. And if you're juiceless, what are you? You're completely useless. And the thing I love about your juice right now is you're you're willing to do W I T whatever it takes, man. I mean, right now you're doing this podcast in a closet. Your wife, your two kids running around, and you decided, hey, I'm going to go into the closet where my office is. Tell us a little bit about that because I can see all the clothing and the shoe racks and stuff behind you. Good decor, my friend. Yeah, yeah. Uh, got a got a new house a few months ago, and it just wasn't working in the living room. We're doing Zoom meetings uh, with the Rams, and it just wasn't working. And my wife hated it in the living room. She said it looked uh, clogged up, I guess, for lack of a better term. So she put me in the closet, and we had some room in here. And uh, apparently, via sound, guys, it, it helps the sound. So hopefully I'm sounding good, and it, it works out. I shut the door, get a lot of stuff done. It's awesome. Fun. So you're just, just hiding in the closet. You're in the closet in the and closet. doing Zoom meetings. Now, as an NFL football player now during coronavirus, interesting. And before we kind of get, in, get into your story while we're, while we're on it, you're in the NFL, you're playing with the Los Angeles Rams, and you guys would probably be near an OTAs and meetings and things. But you do, did you do all those over Zoom? What's that? Yeah, like? 100%. Uh, I think it was seven weeks. And we were actual, actually at, eligible for two more weeks. The NFL and the NFLPA extended that. But uh, Sean, uh, Coach McVay, told us that we were good after last Thursday. But we've been on Zoom meetings um, 10 a.m. or noon here, 10 a.m. in California for uh, about two, two and a half hours uh, just going through. And it's been difficult or it's been rough. But uh, we got new coordinators and stuff, so we're installing a whole new defense over a uh, screen. And so that's taking some extra time. But uh, all putting it together, all good. And so it's kind of worked out. It's been difficult. It's been rough. You've been locked in a closet. One word. <laughs> good. <laughs> good. I, thought, <laughs> I was thinking you were going to say that, man. Well, you know, it's outstanding. We'll get, in, we'll get into good in a little bit. But Justin, oh, yeah. first of all, man, our listeners, would you fill them in on your background and kind of how you first got into, fo into football and powerlifting, you know, and, and kind of your story into the game? Yeah, so I, I began playing football in third grade and immediately fell in love with it. It was just – I just was – the best sport ever in my in a little third grade's mind and uh, grew up playing it. I played all the sports, played baseball, basketball, and soccer a little bit, uh, just growing up, just kind of doing what you do. Uh, and I'm from a small town, so uh, you kind of just do a little bit of everything. That's just kind of what you do. But football was always my passion. And, uh, and, I, and when I got into high school, uh, I just started, you know, I, it's funny, my dad would actually – buy bodybuilding magazines just to kind of look over and just look at stuff. And, and I would, act, I would look at them and like, sheesh, man, these guys are insane. And so I, that kind of started my, I guess, workout processes. Like I just wanted to be a bodybuilder. I would just work out all the time. And then, and then after probably my freshman or sophomore year, I realized like, man, I could be a good football player if I could just or incorporate some football training into it. So it just kind of naturally happened. And I started training for football as well and kind of combining those two. And then I would, you know, after practice, I would go home, eat dinner, and then I'd come back to the weight room and get me a lift in. And then just kind of snowballed from there. And then just teaching myself how to train and go kind of nonstop, but at the same time, be smart about it and rest up. Oh, uh, And then I was just going to go into college. In college, that kind of just transferred. Um, going into SMU, I redshirted. So that gave me a full season to really just juice up, 
not literally juice up, but <laughs> in the weight room, uh, just in the weight room and get better at football as, as a whole and really focus on football and, and in the weight room. And then uh, sophomore year started uh, when Coach Morris came, started for three years straight, played a little bit my freshman year, but not a whole lot, and then started for three years straight. And then uh, after college, um, got drafted in the seventh round in the NFL, and I've been doing that ever since. For I'm going into my third year, I've been in, uh, I was on IR last year. I broke my foot twice, um, so a little uh, adversity there, but no big deal. And then uh, going into my third year this year. Excellent. And you know, Justin, growing growing up in the state of Texas, and and it was interesting. I had a conversation with a, with a high school athlete, sophomore from the state of Vermont. And I said, hey, man, the beauty of you being in Vermont is you don't have to sport specialize. You actually can play three sports and maybe even four yeah. because it's such a small state. And if you're a good yeah. athlete, you're going to be a good athlete in every sport that you do there. Where yeah. in the state of Texas, at what point did you have to make the decision to go all full-time football? Did that point come in your career? Uh, not until college. No, in high school, I played – my senior year, I played football, basketball, baseball, and powerlifted and ran track. So – and I talked to the – recruiter at SMU coach Bird Hill and he was like no I want you to play everything and and come to find out a lot of coaches do that and I when I speak to high schools and stuff I was like each sport gives you a different skill set even though you don't even know it like I played basketball uh, I didn't at the time but I played basketball and I realized that it gave me such an advantage in footwork being being 250 playing basketball helps your footwork and just your overall cardio. So I got that from that baseball, a little bit of eye coordination, catching the ball, hitting the ball, throwing the ball, you know, all that track, just speed, cardio, all these things give you different skill sets that eventually helped me play football better. Awesome. And not to mention you did it in the great state of Texas, you know, and everybody's probably great seen the movie man. in the show Friday night lights. And, you know, you grew up in Texas and it's a place where sports is a huge part of the culture and the community. And it's, you know, it's really a way of life. How did growing up in Texas impact kind of the way you approach sports and the way how you see how important sports are in communities? Every sport in Texas is big, but obviously everyone, people think of Texas and think of football. And, and even now I tell people, even to this day in the NFL, High school football in the state of Texas cannot be beat. When you go to, I go, my brother just graduated and I used to, I flew back several times for his games and high school games in the state of Texas is just, it, it, the magnitude is insane. And so kind of bringing that mentality and, and flying out to Cali, you know, every, everybody has the Texas kind of mentality, I guess, um, people from Texas. So when we fly out there, you know, we let people know where we're from and that we're the best. So just kind of having the fun with, and we have fun with it too, but uh, having that mentality kind of brings an extra oomph to it, I guess. And, you know, you've now been able to play with guys from all over the world as you're playing in the NFL. And, you know, do you feel like the other, other athletes who are playing with you in the NFL from Texas kind of share that same passion for the state? Oh, uh, Absolutely. We always, you just kind of naturally, you don't even know people and you just kind of naturally have their back because of where you're from and, and you kind of know the magnitude that you come out of in the state of Texas. When you've got people from Texas, they got each other's back and you got a ton of closets behind or a ton of uh, clothes <laughs> in your closet behind your back there, man, which is, hey, which is awesome. Hopefully it doesn't get there, but I, I can, I can handle myself for now. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Well, yeah. Justin, at what point, at what point, did you first really believe that you had the potential and what it took to play at the highest level of football and play in the NFL? Yeah, my junior year of college, uh, I had no aspirations um, of playing in the NFL. I, I just didn't think I could do it, to be honest, completely honest. But I had always, and looking back in it too, before, before I even met you in college, I had always had the mentality without even knowing it of, okay, let's just be the best person I can be and have the best year I can be and the rest will kind of take care of itself. So in that realm of controlling what we can control, I kind of did that without even knowing it and without even putting a name on it. But every year at college, you know, let's work my ass off to be the best player I can be and then everything else will go from there. Um, but kind of controlling what you control and what's next in my phase of life, focusing on 100% of that. And then it wasn't until I had interviews with agents and stuff come to SMU um, and at, and kind of say, hey, we think you can play in the NFL. And, and I had to actually other people tell me I could play before I actually thought of it myself. 
Interesting. And did you remember kind of like, it was, was it more like a dimmer switch where it was a slow progress or, or is there one day where it was like a light switch and you were like, man, I can do this. Uh, it was an absolute light switch. I had an interview with an agent and he was just like, I think you could play. And I was, yeah, you know, whatever. And then, and then uh, coach, one of the coaches came to me. It's like, you have seven requests for, from agents, you know, would you like to meet with all of them? And then that, at that second, I was like, wow, you know, like, this may be actually a real deal. And at that moment on, I kind of had focused a little bit more on the future and that whole kind of encompassing. You know, so you're at SMU and the coaches that recruit you, Chad Morris was not the head coach when you first started there. Is that correct? No, June Jones was. He was there for two years. So June Jones is the coach there. And in the middle of your college football career, they hire a new coach in Chad Morris. What was it like for you to have a new head coach come in in the middle of your coaching, of your college football career? It was good for me. Um, there were two completely different coaches, but when the new coach came in, it was kind of like a fresh start for everybody. Everyone kind of saw it like that. Um, but it, it, when Chad first walked into the room, he just demanded respect and excellence, kind of that the vibe you felt from him. And then as soon as he walked in, I was like, oh, this is going to be good. This is going to be good. This is going to be good for us. And so we, the whole team kind of took that mentality, and I think it, it worked out well for us. Speaking of Coach Morris, you know, who, who was at SMU with you for three years, then went to, went to Arkansas, and now the offensive coordinator at Auburn. What were some of the big things that you think, you, from a mental game standpoint, Justin, that maybe you took from your time with Coach Morris that are still a part of what you're doing today in the NFL or just a part of you as a dad and a part of you as a man? Yeah, aside from stuff from you, the biggest thing that I took from Coach Morris is everything matters. Every single thing, every second of every day of every year of e- or every month of every year matters and what you do and not only what you do, but how you do it. Uh, that's I, I still just kind of run that through my head all the time when um, just kind of my weekly going through a weekly schedule or a daily schedule or whatever, just the remembrance of every second matters. And God, Co- Coach Morris did that to me better than anybody that I've seen uh, just with the awareness of that and not only what he did, but how he did it, like I said, but that was definitely the biggest thing that I took. And even in two team meetings, he would just sit there and just everything matters guys, everything. And he would just kind of let that sit just because how important he thought that was. And I still to this day, take that everywhere with me. You know, and you took that with you to the NFL and with, with the Los Angeles Rams. And in your first year with the Rams, the team had a 13-3 and three record, made it all the way to the Super Bowl. What was that yeah. experience like for you growing up in the state of Texas, playing college football, now you're in the NFL, and you're in your first year and your team is in the Super Bowl? What was that experience yeah. like? And, and how did starting with your career with, like, so much success kind of shape your perspective about winning and putting in the work it takes to get there? It was totally, totally surreal, but he talked about swimming. You know, people ought to kind of use that uh, analogy of like swimming to keep your head above water, man. I really, I had to bring out every tool, every, every, every time management thing that I had to, because I jumped in immediately. I played 24 weeks of straight football because I played every, all four preseason games too. So when you prepare for preseason games and then you jump into a relentless 16 week, almost nonstop, you get one bye week schedule of, of nonstop, relentless training, playing, and then doing it all over again. And then you got um, a week off because we had, we were second in the uh, number two seed. So you get the first week off and then you get four more weeks up until the Super Bowl, just relentless. So it was, it was a little bit overwhelming, but I, like to think that I handled it well because of all the tools that I had developed up to that point. But as far as the experience, experience as a whole, it was, I mean, it was just insane to be there. And I kind of had to kind of had to check myself several times because I was more of like more in awe than I was. Let's get ready to go and prepare for what we're about to do. So it was kind of awareness on my part that I had to really check myself several times um, and get to where I needed to be, to be ready to play. Yeah. And it's like your whole life, right? You're growing up watching, watching these guys on TV right. and now it's now you got to go out there and you got to whoop their tail, man. Yeah. And you have, there's no room for error. There's zero room for error. So 
and, and becoming that and the preparation up to that, there's zero room for error in your preparation. Cause if you miss something in your preparation, it's going to, it's going to stand out like a sore thumb on the football field. So that's, that's where I was thankful to have those tools and kind of check myself um, several times leading up to that to make sure I was on point and ready for what I needed to do. And the small part that I had on that football team. You know, and Justin, you've mentioned a lot about the tools that you had to help you to prepare at that high level. You talked about, you know, already keeping kind of a weekly schedule and every second matters. If we can, let's sort of transition now into kind of the mental performance skills and things that maybe we worked on together at SMU or things that you've picked up in, in your journey. What are some of those tools that you feel like are in Justin Lawler's mental game toolbox that makes such a big difference? Yeah. So number one is time. I'm, I am a time management guy to the T and, uh, I schedule every day. It's, it's right over here and let's see if I can find the one today is not detailed cause I'm kind of going on the fly. Uh, but several of them just on my computer, I save them all the time and I wake up every morning. I do my morning routine. I get up, I make me some coffee come in here and I do 20 minutes of yoga. Um, I got my little yoga mat here in the closet, shut the door, just kind of, and it just kind of whatever I feel, you know, I I can meditate a little bit, stretch if my body needs it. Um, I got foam rollers in here, uh, Theraguns for massage, you know, all that for the first 20 minutes, just to kind of wake up, but also kind of have a relaxed, quiet time. And then I go into, I read my Bible every morning. That's kind of my morning routine. And then I'll sit up here and I'll kind of make the schedule for the day. I'm making it daily right now because I'm kind of going on the fly. I don't have a set schedule. So I make my schedule in the morning instead of on Sundays. But um, when we transition to the season and stuff like that, I'll do it a weekly because I'll have a little more structure then. Um, But time to the T and then probably second core values. Uh, I'm in the process. I, I've core values are right now are love communication and patience. And I'm in the process of defining those right now. I, I don't have an exact definition, but I try to do definitions and uh, actionable definitions because that's what gets stuff done to me is actions. And so I, w- I don't want to just have those core values and a definition of them. I want them, I want them to be an action. Um, towards other people or towards myself. Um, so those are the two biggest things right there. But number one, definitely time. So, you know, time management, you've talked a lot about kind of the separation. And I remember back in, back in our days together, when you were at SMU, you know, we talk about creating a 168 plan in the 168 yeah. hours during a week and sitting down on Sunday and mapping yeah. out what that looks like, you know, during the season, because your time yeah. right now, while you're home, it's coronavirus, you, you don't want to schedule every minute of your day because a lot of that time you want to be with your kids and your wife because you're home. But when you're yeah. in season and it's go time, do you get yeah. a lot more structured with what that 168 looks like and a lot uh, more routine in season? Every second of every day is, is detailed, um, detailed, written down during the season. And then you get kind of in that weekly rhythm to where I'll use, I'll create one for the week one. And then I'll get into a rhythm and I'll take week one and just tweak it and adjust it to not only make it better, but to make changes for this week. But it's typically week to week is the same. Sometimes we'll go to London or Mexico or whatever. So that will be a different one. But you get in that weekly rhythm. But yes, in season, every second is accounted for. But that's why I do it in the morning now is because I kind of go through the day and figure out what's best for this day because it's a little less structured and figure out where the best time for that family time is. And then you also have to, you know, my wife make plans and we don't always talk. So you kind of have to adjust and adjust and adapt for those in your schedule, you know, but yeah, in the season, every second's accounted for. You know, you also mentioned the importance of an AM routine. Yeah. And would you talk about the importance of an AM routine and kind of when did you start doing that? Were you doing that back in high school or is that something you kind of started at SMU or in the end? No, I, I, I got that from you. I actually, I got that from you. And then, um, man, I just, when you start your morning doing something that sometimes you don't want to do and you, I think it's for you and listening to you so much is making your bed and not, I don't, I don't make my bed every morning, but I get up and I do cause I still, me, I just want to lay in bed. I think like most of us do. And so getting up and kind of having that rhythm and also helps you get up 
and it also keeps you in that rhythm of, of remi- uh, setting your mindset to attack the day. Hmm. And so that's kind of something that I got from you. But uh, I started that probably my junior year of, of college and just kept doing it shoot for probably five years now. Um, and it changed. Day. Yeah, okay. it changes. Make the days count. And uh, it changes here and there. It just kind of depends on what phase of the year I'm in. Um, but yeah, that's something I got from you. You, you also mentioned meditation. Would you talk to our listeners a little bit about kind of how, how you do meditation? Because I think they see this guy who's, what do you weigh right now? Are you still at 250 or are you, you, you higher no, than that? I'm a little higher, but I'll drop down. My play weight is 250 to 253-ish. So you're 250 pound power lifter, NFL football player with a beard. Yeah. And you're, you're doing a Zoom <laughs> podcast in a closet and you meditate in the closet. Talk a little bit about the meditation. Because <laughs> I think for a lot Man. of guys listening to this, right, they're going to go, yeah. there's an NFL football player who's doing meditation. Like they think yeah. meditation is this kind of ooey, ooey, you know, feel good process when yeah. really, what, what is it and why are you doing it? Sometimes the, the, the reason I started is when you make your schedule and you're accounted for every second of every day is accounted for your mind never really stops and it, it, you kind of get almost not an overwhelmed feeling, but like a, just a busyness feeling. And so when I wake up in the morning, I meditate when I feel like I'm just go, 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 go. And I just need to stop and just relax. And that it could be even five to 10. I think calm call. I use calm, the calm app sometimes. Uh, and it, it should, I think they have five minute meditations and I used to have, uh, we used to use uh, headspace um, for stuff like that. But, uh, it just, even five minutes of just stop relaxation, kind of a reset, um, and getting ready to attack the day is, is critical, critical. And just kind of that stop, relax, gives your brain enough of a break to where you don't feel that busyness or overwhelmed feeling. And this is all, this is for me, this is personally for me, kind of what I feel, uh, enough to where you can feel good and attack the day and get what you need to get done. You know, and a large part of the meditation is the breath. And now if we transition right. this back to your football yeah. field performance, is there a time on the football field, whether it be in timeouts, national anthem, part of a pre-play routine where you take a deep breath that you feel like helps you to focus and get centered and present? Absolutely. All the time. And I'm, I'm on the sideline a little bit more than I'm used to too because I'm a special teamer and then I rotate in on defense I'm not a true starter so that breath um, kind of keeping me engaged in the whole time because I'll I'll get the call from the coordinator which was coach Phillips and I'll go through it in my head on the sidelines to wait, make sure I say the formation know the call know my job and then watch the call on the sideline um, from a different view it changes but I get to where I can see the whole defense and kind of envision myself going through that call on the field um, and that breath helped me because sometimes you'll miss the call or something and it's so easy it's like oh I missed the call so let's take this playoff no and then you kind of use that breath as kind of reset refocus clap your hands do whatever you got to do but I just used just a single breath refocus okay let's get the let's get the next call get locked back in and get into your process that you have during the game so Justin you, you know, obviously you're a starter when you're in high school <clears throat> You get to SMU yeah. and you, be, you quickly become a starter there. So you're used to having that flow of, Hey, when the defense goes on the field, you're going on the field. Now it's a little right. bit different. And you, what you just described for our listeners was using mental imagery and visualization and a technique mm-hmm. called mental reps and those yep. mental reps on the side. I remember at SMU one time, I think you had a broken thumb and I remember yeah. you actually have video of you in practice going through and doing mental reps where you were looking at your keys and taking your first step. Would you talk a little bit about when you first were exposed to this concept of mental reps, what did you, did you completely buy in? Did you find it beneficial? And then how has that kind of evolved over your time now? Yeah, I was, um, I, th- I was a little resistant. I wouldn't say I was totally resistant until I tried it. And that's just kind of was something for me that you, you have to go out and kind of see for yourself type thing. And um, when I was at SMU and I broke my thumb, I, I resorted. I did five weeks of nothing but mental reps. I'd follow the defensive line around and just stand behind the person doing the drill and mirror it in my head and actually do a small motion. Like if I were to shoot my hands, I would shoot my hands, thumbs up. And it's also even during practice, you don't have to be hurt to do this. I still do it when I'm in the Rams and I've got several several clips of film me standing behind. I, you know, I'll get I'll – get, 
coach has to tell me to back up several times because I'm trying to get as close as possible to get as much as a realistic mental shot as I can. Um, but just doing it with during practice, you know, in the NFL, when you get, <clears throat> excuse me, in the last eight weeks of the season, you only get like an hour and a half practice. You bump it down for your body. So every rep, every second counts, like we alluded to, and I'll just get behind in every rep, every get off, um, every drop or every quarter's coverage or whatever, I'll just get a mental shot at it. And you're accumulating reps over time. So you only get three physical reps, but you'll have nine or 12 mental reps that'll accumulate over time and make you a better athlete. All right, so Justin, you talked about mental reps. Let's pull up some clips. So here's a clip of Drew Brees, right? And he's on the sideline. And what you're going to see in this game is he's looking at the huddle. He actually breaks his hands with the huddle, licks his fingers like he's going to be catching a snap. And he's looking out, you know, probably at his defensive keys like you talked about and getting getting reps, right? And then here's one from a a SMU football practice, actually a little bit of some defensive line drills. Can you kind of talk through – you know, what these guys are, are doing in the back here. So you'll see the drill. This is one of our first days where we ever introduced it. Yeah. Yeah, what what we do is you've – it looks like we've got three guys or two guys going, and the two guys behind them are doing their footwork, going through the steps, just nice, easy, gentle footwork. But it's really just the mental part of everything that you're doing as the rep. So that way you not only get – the physical reps when it's your turn, but the mental reps behind it. And then those just accumulate. So all the way over here on the right side, number 99, who's that? You remember? Yeah, that, 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 that is me. That, that is, is me. So, here, so here's Justin Lawler down here in a four point stance all the way on the right. Uh, you can see his number 99 and then behind him is number 97. But if you look at the player who's in a, in a stance behind him, he would be the player getting mental reps. So on the screen, if right. you look over here, you see Justin in the four point stance, 99 to the right side of the screen and behind him there's a player in a stance who's just going to take one hard step here at least it should be oh here we go let's see you see a couple guys kind of get in and there they are so now they're all getting those mental reps boom and how all the and then justin came in and knocked me on my ass how all those <laughs> mental reps add up over time justin talk a little bit about yeah. kind of like you know, like even visualization when you're watching film as a football player to prepare Will you sometimes watch the play on the screen and then ever close your eyes and like see yourself out on the, on the field or do you ever do it standing up where then you'll kind of go through and do the, do the swim move, whatever positioning you're doing. Yeah, I'll do the move standing up. I, I, I struggle to do it, not just sitting down my mind kind of wonder. So I'm a, I, I get up and do it. And I, I know that about myself. So I get up and I, kind of walk through it I'll watch a play on the film and then I can close my eyes and visually visualize the offensive lineman or tight end or whatever um, get a quick shot of what he's doing if he's just a reach block and then I'll visualize how I'm going to react to that or and him in front of me and then me reacting to it or something like that and I think it's also important to note Brian something that I wanted to add was on these mental reps it's this is crucial time and it's also better to focus on little details of what you're doing. Because in football, everything happens so fast. And sometimes it's difficult to work on your thumb sideways when you shoot your hands and thumb up. So when you're doing it at a slow speed and just taking one hard step and then just kind of finishing the rep as it goes, it's so much easier because the rep is slowed down so much to work on those little details. And, you know, when we first got in the NFL, the – the coach was like, we want a six inch step, not an eight inch step, not a nine. Inch. And then so many people would be like, well, why does that even matter? But there's a purpose behind it. And those mental reps are so easy to slow down and get a perfect exact six inch step compared to a nine inch step or something that uh, because it's slowed down and it's so much easier just to kind of focus on those little details during those mental reps. One well, at that level that you're performing at. The difference between a six six inch step and a nine inch step is probably the difference between giving up six or not. Yeah, right, right. And so those those mental reps give you a slowed down step or a slowed down rep of really perfecting that six inch step. Hmm. You know, Justin, I want to come back here for a second to something that you you talked about that I remember as a player. I I I was like, wow, this guy's this guy's impressive. And the thing that was impressive to me about you was not necessarily like the physical gifts, right? It's not, it's not that yeah. you were this freak athlete who could go do things that no one else could do. It was the consistency. 
It was the, it was the desire to learn and get better. It was the constant question asking to try to understand at a deeper level. And really it was someone who I think lived by a set of core values and core principles. And I remember at SMU, one of the things that we did is we had a set of core values as an, as a team. And we had all the players in the locker room vote on which guys in our team best represent these core values. And you were either number one or in the top two or three of every one of those core values. So your teammates saw you as somebody who was not living based off of preference and what they felt like doing, but living off of a set of principles. Why are having a set of core values or core principles so important for you? For me, it gives me a foundation. Uh, uh, it gives me really just a foundation of of who I am, and I think that that's important to know. Um, and and it, Coach Morris would always allude to the core values of a team guide us in the mix of adversity. So having that kind of mission statement and core values when adversity hits or something, those those values, those things that you look to most kind of guide you and they'll help you come up better on the other side. So you mentioned earlier, love, communication, and patience. Uh, patience, yeah. Patience were core values of yours. There, are, those, are those some things that you just made decisions on? This is who I want to be? Or is this something that was kind of passed down to you from your family? How did you come up to love, communication, and patience? No, that's, that's something that I came up to, and that's really who I want to be. Um, love because well and I actually came up with love before everything that's kind of going on with everything um that was a few while ago communication because that's something I need to get better at my wife tells me all the time I'm a terrible communicator so that's something that I wanted to improve on myself and patience um that's kind of a broad one and I'm struggling to come up with a definition of that one exact definition of that one um, but patience for the process, patience with myself, patience and getting better. Um, that one kind of came to is after I, br- I broke my foot and I was on IR this past year and I was so impatient with the rehab. And there's a process that takes uh, to get to recover and get back from uh, rehab and an injury. And I was very impatient. And that's something that I recognized and I wanted to change about myself. Um, so th- those three things really are just kind of who I wanted to become. So yeah, I love that. And, and, and you mentioned kind of going back and really self-reflecting on saying, Hey, when I was coming back from this injury, I was, I was not as patient as I wanted to be. So I decided that patience would become a core value of mine yeah. mm-hmm. because it's something that I wanted to develop into not necessarily who I was because who you are right. in this moment is simply a residual of your past, but who you become in the future will not be by chance, it will be by choice. So what I want what I want our listeners to understand is that the core values that Justin Lawler has of love, communication, and patience, right now, as of the middle of June 2020, those are conscious decisions that you're making, and those may adjust as you move forward, is that, and as you grow in your life and your career. Is that accurate? No, that's 100% accurate, and that's funny you say that, because before I, we hopped on this call, I looked at my MVP process that we made uh in your rv van <laughs> rv uh uh whatever the rented rv that you had and uh, i came in there and we made it and it was love was the same uh consistency and integrity those were the three things so one it stayed the same because that's always kind of who i want to be is just a loving person a love someone that puts others before themselves sacrifices for others um, and then, but the consistency changed because I felt like I was pretty consistent. I felt like I had gained traction of that and I was doing that pretty well. And then the integrity, I feel like, I felt like I was doing what was right, um, when it was required of me and, and all the time. Um, so those kind of change just in the phase of life that I have, um, like you just said. Love that. So, you know, you mentioned, you mentioned sitting in the RV, <laughs> um, sitting in the RV, as a matter of fact, let me go back to share the screen and show this. This is, this is funny. Uh, I, I rented an RV at one point. It's called Brian, 63 <laughs> hours life of Brian Kane. And here we are at, oh, SM, they, they, you know, going the through documentary. Pretty, soon, pretty soon. You're about to see J- Justin Lawler in the RV, breaking it down, right? We rented an RV for three days, cruise, ar- cruise around the state of Texas, doing some work. Here's El Chapitan, Coach Mark <laughs> Smith, 
you know, and here we are inside of the RV. I know I'm sitting here breaking it down with Justin Lawler right there in the RV talking yeah, about baby. MVP process. So we're parked outside the football stadium. You know, this is not something I do all the time, although I probably <laughs> should because it was quite epic. But, you know, Justin, talk about MVP process and what exactly is that and how do you use that as a, as a person? Yeah, the MVP is uh, mission, vision, and principles. And I kind of – I just really – my the bulk of what I use right now is just principles, kind of who I want to be and what I want to focus on. Um, and like I said, I want to – exact define those principles and I want an actionable definition in that uh, definement, I guess, for lack of a better term. Um, but I use those on who I want to be and who I want to become eventually. Um, and I also, I haven't become, uh, have a mission statement. Um, the last one I had on the mission visit, uh, vision principles was Justin Lawler is a, a God fearing man who has a rel relentless pursuit to become elite. And that was my mission then. It would probably continue to be that then. Um, vision, it's kind of, you could define this, define this a little better than I could, to be honest. But I really just use the mission and principles. And then I just kind of define them then. So. Well, in the, in the, so, the, so the mission is essentially, what do we want written on our gravestone? The vision is, what do we want on our resume? Yeah. Right? So part of your vision yeah. is get to the NFL. Part of your vision is is have, have as long a career as you can, you know, and you have life visions, which are in the future and you have kind of your, you know, yeah. your weekly vision, which is your 168 and your daily vision, kind of, which is your schedule. And the unique part about being in the NFL where you guys play once a week and it's so yeah. structured and you talked about mapping out your minute of every, you know, every minute of every day is that's essentially taking the place of your vision because you know, I'm a professional football player. What's my goal? Be the best professional football player, husband and father that I can. It's really clear yeah. for you. And then you structure your week and your values to help you to get there. So it's a very simple process. And it's a matter of just now you're just repeating that, but trying to repeat it with intention versus going through the motions, which happens a lot. I think when people get into a routine, it's always a challenge of a routine. How do you keep your routines fresh and sharp so you stay motivated versus those routines becoming monotonous and something that you have to do? I really don't get bored of it because I know how important it is, to be honest. Uh, I it, When this whole COVID thing started happening and we were stuck in our house, it, that became critical. On days that I wouldn't do it, I would hardly get anything done, and I'd be um, very default, I guess, and just kind of wander around and not have any guide or anything. But And that started happening. Uh, I just I, – to me, it's just important. So I've never really gotten bored of it or monotonous because in the off season, it changes every day and in season, uh, you understand the importance of it. So personally, I, I just haven't gotten bored of it because I know how important it is. You just mentioned something you just said, I think it's default and I know exactly where you're going. You're talking about above the line or below <laughs> the line for our listeners. Yeah. Would you explain, explain above the line, below the line and discipline default. Yeah, discipline default is something that was introduced, and I love it. But discipline is discipline action, something that is intentful, pur purposeful, and really brings you forward, I guess, pro progress. Default is something that you do. Um, you do default, and it's unintentful, it's unpurposeful, and it's just kind of thought of or, uh, like you said, monotonous, and you just kind of come up with it, and it has no purpose behind it, and it's not bringing you – or it's not making you progress or bringing you forward. Beautiful. You know, and, and we would call the, the default is below the line, basically losing, mm -hmm. losing behavior, right, yeah. where discipline is above the line, which is winning behavior. And, Justin, you've talked about – a ton of above the line behaviors from time management to MVP process to AM routine to meditation to setting core values to, to uh, being above the line to taking mental reps. I mean, to having a weekly schedule to every second matters to attacking the day. I mean, you've got some tools, man, that it's really impressive that you have taken these with you from our time together in college to all the way now in the yeah. NFL. I mean, it's really impressive, man. Yeah. Well, if you don't use them, you get behind. And that's like you say about the mental game. I mean, 90% of coaches don't use the mental game to where a hundred percent of coaches will agree that the mental part of the game is probably 90% of what 
the athletes are performing. And so these tools, they're, I mean, at SMU, they were free, uh, free information. So why would I not take them and use them and utilize them? And after you use them, like I said about the mental thing or the uh, mental rep thing, it, you're kind of skeptical at first, but then you use them, you realize how, how much they help you, how much more productive you can be and how much progress you make towards your goals to what you're trying to do that, they, they really become a part of you and you make that a habit instead of making a conscious choice of like, okay, this is my morning routine. You wake up and it's like, you feel weird if you don't come in here and do your morning routine because you've done it for so long and you made it such a habit. And then I do that. I mean, if I don't do my yoga in the morning, it, it, it bothers me. It lingers with me for the rest of the day. So it- Justin, do you, let me ask you this. Do you think you would be sitting in the position you are, not in the closet with the clothing behind you, but sitting in, sitting in the NFL <laughs> and having been, having been to a Super Bowl and pl- still playing in the NFL if you did not ever get exposed to the mental game when you were in college? No, it, it, it's not even close. Not even close. And if you, if you would if, take all the tools away and introduce to me time management and scheduling, I would say maybe. That's how important that is to me and for me, because I will wander off into God knows where if I don't have that structure. But if you take everything away from me, no, I, I w- not even close. And do you feel like, I mean, you got to feel like the, is you're in an NFL locker room, right? And there's guys getting drafted every year coming in who are younger, faster, mm-hmm. stronger, you know, that coming from, from big time power five football conferences. I mean, you're in, you're in the best football in the world. Do you right. still feel like the mental game gives you a significant competitive edge and you look at other guys in the locker room and go, man, if they, if they only had this, if they had only been exposed to this, do you see that? Or does everyone come into the NFL with these tools? No, I see that. I see that 100%. If, if some, some of the guys are extremely talented and can play football very well, but they could be good, good to great if they had, excuse me, these tools to help them get to great and those progressing, those moving forward tools, I guess. And um, a lot of people say the phrases that you and I would probably say, um, but they're not actionable on those phrases, if that makes sense. That's why all my core values, when I define them, they it has to be an actionable definition because actions get things done, phrases and words don't. Phrases and words are good, but – if they don't have the action behind them, then they're useless. And so I think a lot of people, because when they're in college, they hear all these phrases, they hear coaches with good intent, they hear this, they hear that. And then it just kind of becomes a part of them, but there's no action behind those phrases. Well, you know how it is. I mean, even, I don't know if it's the same way in the NFL, but when you're in college, we got a 21 day training camp in August, mm-hmm. they bring in a different motivational speaker. Every three days, you get exposed to seven different speakers over 21 days and yeah. they all got great content. But the difference, I think, between, you know, our work together where, where I was there 50 days a year with you guys at SMU for, I think, your last three years is the difference between a speaker who gives you a concept in a system or, or a relationship of coaching where it's saying, hey, here's the concept. Now, let's put this into your behavior and what you do. Mm-hmm. Would you talk a little bit about the difference between, like, hearing a speaker versus having a system? Yeah, I, I would... I was listening to a podcast with Urban Meyer on Focus 3 the other day while I was uh, on the bike, and Urban, Urban said he would almost never bring in a speaker because it, it wasn't in total alignment of the system and values that they had in place. And so he would interview a speaker for almost one to two hours longer than they would speak to ensure that they were in total alignment with that, and he would tell them what to talk about. Um, but anyway, on just kind of adding on that, it's like it has to be in total alignment, like I just said, with what you're doing, because you can take information here, but it doesn't do anything unless it's in alignment of what you hear and preach every day, if that makes sense. Well, and it's the exact point of you saying you, you've mentioned this many times of my core values have to have an actionable definition. And yeah. it's the difference between saying, oh, I'm going to be patient. Okay, well, what the, you know, it's, or it's a, or it's like with core, with SMU. Remember the core values we had there, one of which was family. It's like, well, what does that actually mean until you define it and you say this is what a family looks like, right? So you can yeah. say, I want to be patient, but what does patience look like? You know, patience right. with the process, patience with yourself, patience with yeah. making progress. 
you know, and as a guy who was a college football player and, and had, a, had a child at the time, talk about the difference that that made in your perspective compared to maybe your peers when you were in college. Yeah, it, it changed my perspective a lot. Not only um, before we met and I was introduced to the middle game, but, bef- but uh, before that, excuse me, uh, it really grounded me and it made me grow up a lot faster than I was ready for to be honest. And, um, I had someone that I had to take care of. So the work, um, and the schooling and, and all the whole nine yards, uh, meant a lot more to me than probably your average person. But that whole thing, it really made me grow up and really understand and appreciate where I was at and what I had. It made you focus more in terms of being on a mission and what you were yeah. doing instead of just kind of like, I see a lot of college athletes, that just they kind of go through the motions and they kind of flounder without a focus where I felt like one of the gifts that you had, or it's not a gift, it's a skill that you developed was you were laser focused all the time. Yeah. A mission, you brought up mission. A mission would be a good uh, term, term to use that with just driven upon no end. You know, talk about that drive and the mission. And, you know, we're talking patience a little bit here is that, you know, Justin, you've had some adversity, right? I mean, I think a lot of times when we look at professional athletes, we think that the the road is always the gold, the uh, the yellow brick road. It's paved in gold, and it's easy. And these guys have some great skill set. And you know, you have worked ridiculously hard. And in 2019, yeah. you know, you had a foot injury where you missed the majority of the season. How did that injury, you know, in that experience of going through that, how did that help you? And just in terms of sharpening your mindset for overcoming obstacles. Yeah, well, it it really made me be grateful for where I was and what I had, uh, for sure. But it also gave me it was kind of like my redshirt year. Like I've done, I've accomplished so much um, in the past probably eight months since I was put on IR. It gave me so much more time to sharpen those skills, focus on stuff that um, less than training with my body and more about my mind. And, um, more specifically in training of my joints, strengthening my joints. So that way I could progress to be better after this than I was before, instead of just coming back the same. And during this time, right, whether it's during coronavirus or it's coming back from the foot, what are ways that you stay positive during difficult times, Justin? Well, I stay focused on what I, my goals, um, what I want to achieve kind of other things um stay close to my family and I stay away from news because all the news is is just negative negative stuff um but I stay focused on my inner circle basically and that keeps me going that keeps me positive you know Justin I know in addition to being a a world-class you know professional football player and a world-class man you're also a man of faith Mm -hmm. and you frequently share you know some of your inspirational clips on social media and been very vocal about the importance of faith in your life. How has your faith sort of shaped your approach in life on and off the field? Yeah, the the Bible as a whole is um, a guide, uh, a great foundation to live upon. Um, I, like I said, I read it, I, well, not every morning, but just about every morning during my AM a. routine. Um, it's just something to be grounded upon and have a great foundation to build off of other things. And, uh, when you don't know where to go or don't know what to do, um, the word of God is a great place to start and to get words from the Bible words from, uh, or timeless truths, I guess, as some people say it, uh, it's a great place to start to stay positive and, um, to continue to grow and to continue to love as, as one of my core values. Awesome. I mean, Justin, man, you have shared so many tools today, so much actionable takeaway for our listeners. Uh, it's, it's really been incredible, you know, and, and from the time management to the meditation, to the AM routine, to the mental reps, to the scheduling, to the attack in every day, to, you know, having a set of core values with actionable definitions to the difference between default and, and discipline. Um, to just simply making your bed, you know, and the places where people can start, there's so many that you've shared today. And, you know, there's going to be a lot of young athletes listening to this podcast that want to achieve or come close to achieving the levels of success that you have. If you could remove the skull cap of everyone as a young athlete, let's say, let's say high school and below listening to this podcast, let's say college and below, 
if you could remove that skull cap and you could plant one seed, one thought that would germinate and that they would do, what would that one thing be to help them excel? Probably what we talked about most is time management. Time is the only thing that you and every other athlete has in common. And it's the one thing that you will never get back. What is it? Coach Morris used to say time words and opportunities. You never get any more of them. And so to use that time to your advantage, to whatever you're doing, to whatever you're progressing to um, is of utmost valuable to you and to the people around you. Awesome. And Justin, I want to thank you for, for taking the time out of your 168, your busy schedule, taking the time as you locked yourself in the closet there to have some quiet time to be able to share your story with, with our listeners. And I know your kids are probably running around the house wanting to know where dad is. So we're going to cut you loose here. Justin, thank you for joining us. And for our listeners, be sure to follow Justin Lawler uh, on Instagram. It's at Lawler, L-A-W-L-E-R, Justin 99. Again, at Lawler, Justin 99. Justin, thanks for being a guest with us today, my friend. Good to see you. Man, appreciate you having me. A lot of good talk, a lot of good stuff. Any, anything you need, let me know. Thanks for listening to the Brian Kane Mental Performance Podcast on the Ironclad Content Network. If you liked the show, be sure to leave us a rating and a review. And don't forget to follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Brian Kane Peak. I'll see you next time.